<coughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for giving me a message to bring forth to the brethren. A little stuffy nose, feeling the cold few days, but I'm okay. By the time you hear this message, if you have not listened to a Wednesday message, it probably will tie into that. I try not to intermix them, but I will be guided by the Lord. When I was seeking, I had a Wednesday message, and then Pastor asked me would I preach something on Thursday or even record it. And as always, I sought the Lord for a message, and one morning, one me pray, Father, I invite you to this service, I invite you to this meeting. May your will be done. May your will be done. Help me to preach and bring forth this word that the brother may understand according to their spiritual maturity. Be my voice, be my mind, be my thought, Father. Speak to me. Allow me to hear what you want me to hear. And I pray for those who listen, who have understanding and grow from what you have shared with me. Now, as I was thinking about the message and what I should say, I was wondering what I should preach on Thursday. And I turned on the radio prior to going to work and I heard a Christian minister talking on a Christian station and he was talking about uh, the Catholic doctrine of the 95 Thesis and something that caught my mind was indulgence. Hope I'm able to pronounce it with a stuffy nose. I apologize if I sound off. But he spoke about the 95 thesis was nailed to the door, or supposed to be nailed to the door when I did my research. It said it was written on the wall of the door of a church or nailed on the door, depending on who write the writing at that time. But it supposed to be a, an event that took place 500 years ago but let me begin with this scripture verse open up let me see what i want to say and i thought about it and i said and i felt in my spirit that the lord wanted me to talk about indulgence you know the indulgence among the christian groups and he gave it to me and i ponder on it thought about it, struggle with how to bring forth the message. I'll be turning to Psalm 53. It probably will be a part two of the message, but I'm laying the foundation for you. Psalm 50, verse 3. Our God comes and does not keep silent. A fire devours before him and around about him a mighty tempest rage. The title of the message is God will not be silent. God will not be silent. Got my iPad on. God will not be silent. We live in an era where we're living in an era where lots of things are being said and spoken of and we both need to keep mostly keep our mouth closed. So I struggled with the title. I played it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and following the thoughts that came to me, God showed me something very interesting that I couldn't make it up. If you thought I made it up or went to look for it and try to throw it together. It didn't come from me. It had to be God revealing to me. So I'm going to throw out the spiritual nugget to pique your interest to see where I'll be coming from. It's almost like going out to dinner and you have an appetizer and you get the main course and you get the dessert. But when God gave me this message, I couldn't believe what he had shared, shared with me. So it's my hope that you get an understanding and allow the Lord to move you to see where he's coming from. The title of God will not be silent. 
Was there a time that God was silent? Some of us probably are unaware that if there was a time, according to scripture, that God was silent for 400 years. There are no doctrine, no teaching, no prophet, no word. And I did some research and I came across what is the history between the Old Testament and the New Testament? Most people are not even aware that there is such a gap. But there is a 400 year gap when the Old Testament leaves off, the Jews have just returned back to Babylonian captivity and the Persian Empire is in full swing. When Jesus entered the scene, it is 400 years later. So there, the scripture declares, I think it said Malachi was the last book from Malachi to the New Testament, give or say 400 years, but God was silent. But God is not silent anymore. He is speaking to those who they have chosen that will say what doth say the Lord. And I thought about that, that most people do not know that what God said, it said according to we know written writings and nothing spoken until Jesus appeared on the scene in the book of Matthew. So there was a period of 400 years where God was silent. But God is not silent today. He's speaking to those who he wants to speak to. And he shared something with me in, like I mentioned, the 95 Thesis. I'm going to paraphrase it. If I'm off here or there, forgive me. The gentleman decided, let me read it, find it. Like I said, I'm quite sure it's going to be on that go. The 95 Thesis was about when taking place in 1517, Martin Luther, a professor of moral theology, University of Wittenberg, Germany, and a drop down to the document advances Luther position against what he saw in abuse of practice of clergy selling penitentiary indulgences. I N D U L E I'm sorry, I N D U L G E N C E S. My nose kind of stuck so like I'm not saying. Which were certificates supposed to reduce the temporal punishment in purgatory for the sins committed by the purchase of the loved one. In the thesis, Luther claimed that repentance required by Christ in order for our sin to be forgiven involved inner spiritual repentance rather than merely external sacramental confession. He argues that indulgence led Christians to avoid true repentance and sorrow for sin, believing that they could forego it by obtaining an indulgence. These indulgences, according to Luther, discourage Christians from giving to the poor and performing other acts of mercy, which were attributed to the belief that indulgence certificates were more spiritually valuable. Luther claims that his position challenged the 14th century church, stating that the using of these merit of good deeds or past sin to forgive punishment for sin. And what was the main point of the 95 Thesis? It focused on selling forgiveness, building a cathedral, and the church had the power to forgive, I'm sorry, distribute forgiveness and the damage of the indulgences caused grieving sinners. And I thought about it. And I say, wow, where is that today in the body of Christ? From my experience prior to coming to Living Epistle Ministry, and even today, we are hearing ministers come up and say, God has given me a scripture, Psalm 91, send me $91. They use a certain scripture and say, God says, send me that amount. When you send that specific amount, then God in return will give you this, I will forgive you of your sins, I will heal you, or whatever they use into, you know, prayer cloth or holy oil or whatever. They're selling the word of God to please those who want to be delivered from something. So in actuality, they're doing almost the same thing 
in a different way in the 20th century, selling the word of God, claiming that you're not healed because you're not giving more than what you should give and making the people feel bad that the reason why God has not healed them or delivered them from such and such is because they're not giving to the church 10%. Yes, you should give 10%. But they practice, and they use Malachi chapter 3 to beat on the people's head and say, you know, I'll probably get to it and read to you that because it's not in my notes, but it just came to me. And they use it against people to make them feel bad. And if you think about it, even if you can recall back in the day that the early church where people we didn't have the mega churches that we have today and people went to the church on the corner and you gotta get a stiff of God word straight you know that tell you about what you're doing is wrong but now today that is not even mentioned you know our sinful behavior is not mentioned you know we mentioned that God it is mentioned that God wants to heal us but the Bible declares that everyone was not healed in the Bible you're not healed because you lack faith. Is it because, are you not healed because the message is being preached and you're feeding the sheep the wrong message? So the church is in some form practicing indulgences, feeding the people false doctrine, false teaching, and hope them to believe that God will grant them special permission to continue to sin God will grant the permission that they are on the right track and sooner or later he will deliver them or you know let your mind wander and, and if you think about it any given Sunday any given day you turn on TV you probably will hear something in a form of indulgence and what are so many indulgence 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 I'm sorry excuse me indulgence indulgence simply means doing something that you enjoy even if it has a negative consequences people say you indulge in, in too much food you indulge in too much drugs you indulge in too much sex you indulge in, in whatever knowing that it have a negative consequences when the body of Christ in the churches, the ministry, whoever is preaching the word of God, feed the people their lives, and the people welcome their lives, and some are aware of the consequences, they are indulging in false teaching. And we know Christmas and communion and pagan holidays and Easter and Valentine's Day. In many things that the Bible strictly forbids from doing, but yet people do them. I was a partaker in all those things prior to learning about living the Christian ministry. I indulged sexual relationships without being married, in fornication, drinking when I shouldn't drink, didn't do that. Drugs, tried, didn't do drugs. We can say we lie, steal and cheat, or whatever. If you look at yourself in the mirror, you probably come back and say, yes, you are, you are indulging right now. What are you indulging in that God is saying that you need to get rid of? So as I begin to go through this message, I struggle with what direction to go in. And I'm just giving you, and the Lord pointed me out Four things that I'm going to call them spiritual nuggets. The Lord revealed to me in this message how back when in the book of Malachi to Matthew, there was 400 years of silence where the reading that I read said there was no prophet, nothing came from God for 400 years. Until Jesus appeared, the man, Jesus the man appeared in the book of Matthew into the Israel. You ever heard where someone is being abused in some form? They say, I refuse to remain silent anymore. 
I'm going to tell what I'm experiencing. There are individuals in my sound of my voice or will listen to this, or you may know someone that has decided that I refuse to remain silent. And I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to share my thoughts. God is telling you and I today, he's not silent anymore. He's speaking to those who he has chosen to speak through. We must listen to his voice, listen to what's being said of anyone, and ask God, our Father, is that him speaking the word? Is that him saying, do this, don't do that? So he's going to use us to be his spokesperson. So God has not, is not silent. The 95 thesis, and I, it's 95. They go in order, but I'm picking out certain ones. You can read it and be in the notes. You can Google it and, and look at, find the PDF version and, and read what his complaint was against the church at that time. God used anyone from different, you can say God can use anyone of a different nomination to speak the truth. And it is a lot of truth and a lot of religion. Listen, we may not want to agree. We don't have to agree with everything, but there's some truth in a lot of religion. So this particular thing about it, God remained silent for 100 years. And I think this particular 95 thesis took place in 1517. 500 years and his complaint was what was taking place in the church what was happening in the church that he was obviously against so I'm going to read certain things one when I call it the number going to be the order of the 95 thesis he when he wrote he said the Reverend Father Martin Luther intend to defend the following statement and to dispute on them in that place. Therefore, he asks that those who cannot be present and dispute with him orally shall do so in the absence by a letter. If they have a disagreement in what he's saying, you cannot be there orally to dispute it. Send a letter. Where have we heard that? In this ministry, when pastor has sent out books and and teach certain subjects, she welcomed you and I or anyone to ask questions. Type in an email and ask her questions. If you have a dispute in something that she said, don't say what she's preaching or have said is wrong. Just send an email out there if you cannot come in 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 her presence. But one, when the Lord our Master Jesus Christ said repent, Matthew 4 17, he willed the entire life of the believer to be one of repentance. I'm going to go to two, the word cannot be understood as referring to the sacrament of repentance, that is confession and satisfaction administered by the clergy. Number three, yet it does not mean solely into repentance. Such in repentance, repentance is worthless unless it produces very outward modification of flesh. I'm dropping out in six. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that he has been remitted by God. It has been remitted by God. Or to be sure by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment, if his right is granted, permission in these cases were disregarded. The guilt will remain, certainly remain, Unforgiven. Then I go to number 21. Those, thus, those indulgence, indulgence preachers are an error who say that man is absolved from every penalty and saved by the indulgence. 27. They preach only human doctrine and say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. Number 32, those who believe 
that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will certainly be there together with their teachers. 35, you see, uh, those who, they who teach their contrition is not necessarily on part of those who intend to buy souls out of purgatory or to buy confessional privilege preach unchristian doctrine. 36, any true repentant Christian has the right to full remission of guilt, I'm sorry, penalty and guilt, even without indulgence letters. 40, a Christian who is surely contrite seek and love to pay penalty for his sin, the bounty of indulgence, however relaxed penalty that caused men to hate them, at least it furnished occasion for hating them. I'm just pointing out certain things that Christian, no, 3043, Christian are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy does a better deed than one who buys indulgences. Christian ought to be taught, 45, Christian ought to be taught that when he sees someone, a man needy, and pass him by, yet gives his money for indulgences, does not buy indulgences but God's wrath. 46, Christians are to be taught that unless they have more than they need, they must reserve enough for their family needs and by no means squander their own indulgences. 47, Christians are to be taught that they are buying of indulgences is a matter of free choice, not commandment. Christians, 49, Christians are to be taught that indulgences are useful only if they do not put their trust in them but very harmful if they lose their fear of God because of them. 53, they are enemy of Christ and forbid altogether preaching the word of God in some churches order that indulgences may be preached by preached in others. 54, injury is done to the word of God when the same sermon of equal or larger amount of time is devoted to indulgence in the word. Think about that one. A lot of time I've gone to churches where it's a lot of music, 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 music. Sometimes it goes on for 45 minutes or close to an hour. Nothing wrong with music if the Holy Spirit is leading the music, but to focus on the music only and very little word of God. And then the minister get up there and preach for 10 or 15 minutes and then people go home. They put their more effort into the music calling down a hope to call down the Spirit of God and then the minister preach whatever and the people go home. They put their faith, their more time devoted to pleasing the people, giving the people what they perceive what the people want. So they're feeding the people things that they should not be eating. 62, the true church, I'm sorry, the true treasure of the church is most holy gospel of glory and grace of God. 71, let him who speaks against the truth concern the dungeon be amatheo and a curse. 76, we say on the contrary that indulgence cannot remove the very least of venal, venal sins as far as guilt is concerned. And the last one, 94, Christians should be exhorted to be diligent in following Christ their head through penalty and got death in hell. And I thought about this. This individual, they say written four or five hundred years ago, came forth because he saw a problem in the church that he was affiliated with. God can use anyone to go against or to preach against anything. If the right person don't want it, if someone don't want to do it, he calls somebody else. He calls someone else to bring forth the truth. He may not like it coming from a religion or a sect that we don't agree with heartily, I mean wholly, but if they're speaking the truth, we should accept 
that part of the truth that what they're saying. God was not silent when he used this individual. They come against the teaching of his time. It said he nailed the 95 thesis to a wall through the doorpost. And like I said, it said that he was written it on the wall of the door, like a bulletin board outside. Depending on what version you want to believe. We live in a climate right now that God is not silent. We, if you start hearing a voice from heaven, from the Father, you'd be looking around like, what? But he uses people of different race and different sex. You may not like me. You may not like a male or a female who preach the word. God does the choosing who he wants. So as he continued to give him this message, thought and thought, God is not silent. But then he showed me where Living Epistle Ministry and CCK, Living Epistle Ministry first and CCK. So a little bit of appetizer. Then that God, the Father, was quiet, silent for 400 years. Jesus appeared on the scene. The man, Jesus, now he appeared on the scene. And we read that in Matthew chapter, in the uh, book of Matthew. Then, prior to that, the Bible's written. I don't have it. I saw it. I got to find it. I'll cover it in my second part. Then the Bible's written and brought on the scene. And man had the Bible, the word of God. So there were different stages where God, from the after the 400 years of being silent, began to move through those who he called. And then Matthew, down to the book of Revelation, and all the disciples. Then, if you look at our era, the 1517, the 995 thesis, and then, for those of you who have never heard of it, then you have the Zuzu Street Revival, took place in 1906 and 1916. And then you think about Living at Pilsen Ministry, when Pastor First began in 1970, then the doctrine of Christ came in forth in 1988. And God was speaking to all of those events. We, myself included, did not recognize that God was speaking. He's speaking now. But what he showed me, and I'm still putting the notes together, how he is moving right now. This gentleman spoke against what he saw was error. Living in Pilsen Ministry, the teaching, the YouTube channel, the many books that Pastor have wrote. Thus saith the Lord thy God has given her to speak the doctrine of Christ to us. And then I, following the leading of the Lord, I went to find a Zuzu Street and I read certain things I highlighted. Highlight. The Zuzu Street Revival was a historic series of revival meetings that took place in Los Angeles, California, led by William J. Seymour, an African preacher. The revival began in 1906 and continued to 1915. On the night of April the 9th, 1906, Seymour and seven men were waiting on God on Bonnish Bray Street. When suddenly they were hit by as suddenly as though hit by a bolt of lightning, they were knocked from their chair to the floor, and the seven men began to speak in tongues and shout out praise in the Lord. The news quickly spread, the cities were stirred, crowd gathered, service was moved outside to accommodate the crowd who came from all around. People fell down at their approach and attributed it to God. People were baptized in the Holy Spirit and the sick were healed. The testimony of those who attended the Zuzu Street Revival was I am saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I dropped down to uh, the participants were criticized by some secular media and Christian theology for behavior considered to be outrageous, outrageous and unorthodox, especially at that time. Let me read that again. The participants were criticized 
by some secular media and Christian theologians for our behavior is considered to be outrageous and unorthodox. When I read that particular passage, I said, when God begins to move and open the door for the Nicholas and ministry to come on the world scene, and even we see little bits of it now, that what we've been told, hearing our pastor preach, some people oppose the message, don't like the message, say she should not be teaching and preaching because she's a woman, and they attack the message, or they don't, they find some reason not to even consider what's being said either is from God, or they may be aware of it from God, but they don't want to be a part of it. And I say in many of my messages, when God, we see what's happening in the world scene today, we are told that we must be quiet and shut up and do what I say. And I said in one of my messages, the word, the ministers are not exempt from the same thing. Ministers would not be exempt from experiencing what we see in the world today. I'm trying to be careful in my words. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. Ministers, when the body of Christ, when Christ began to manifest through any one of us or anybody through the past, Sheila, through any one of us or whoever God called out there, preaching and teaching the word of God and begin to preach and teach what God wants them to speak, they will be verbally attacked and say what you're saying is in truth is not true. Because look at us, we on TV, we got thousands of followers, we got many books, and you down in the corner, you in the house, and you in your basement. And they will be attacked. They will claim that what that true church manifests in the mind of God from the Father is doing, they will be attacked and saying it's not true. Do you believe me? He said, no, Anthony, no, that don't happen. Do you have a Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Everyone that God called to bring forth his word, were they attacked verbally, physically, and some die in the result of preaching and teaching the word of God? So we're going to begin to see that. We'll begin, we are going to begin to see. This message is for those of us who are listening, who has been listening to God. But it's message also to other individuals that God is not silent no more. He's not silent. He is going to be heard. We may not like the messenger, but if we are speaking the message that God wants to be heard and spoke and preached, God is not silent no more. What we see and what we experience, all is coming from God. We just have to ask the Father. And then I was thinking about when I was preparing the message when Jesus I'm just following the Lord. When the disciples say, Lord, they saw him praying at a certain place. So, Lord, teach us how to pray. He said, when you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Our Father want us to receive his spiritual blessing. Just like he sent Jesus. Just like he sent all the prophets in the Old Testament to speak his word similar to what uh, the gentleman did in the 95 Thesis. He saw a problem and he spoke the word. I don't know if they're still doing it today, the adults, but that's besides the point. God can use anyone to come forth to bring attention to what appear to be known and okay. God, our Father, want us to know He's silent no more. He has been speaking. He has been speaking in living in Christian ministry since 1970 through our pastor, faithful servant of God, down to 2020 and many more years from that. He used the bishop to bring forth the 95 Thesis. God appeared. That was a major event 500 years ago. And not and before the Zuzu Street event took place, there was nothing. People were going to church. God began to show himself in the Zuzu Street revival. Some people, clergymen and media, 
didn't accept it. They thought it was unorthodox, especially at that time. Then I go say it was, uh, let's see, how I, where I'm at. White families from local holiness church began to attend as well. The group well regularly prayed and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it said, uh, next meeting, Mr. Seymour shared a testimony and he preached a sermon on Acts 2 4, and six others began to speak in tongues, including uh, Mr. Seymour's wife, Mom Jane, who later became his wife. And they spoke in tongues for the first time after praying all night long. Let me see. This will be in your notes. And I go to people of all ages flock to Los Angeles with, skept with both skepticism and desire to participate. The Anglo the Anglo the Anglo the intermingling of races and the group encouragement of women in leadership was remarkable. As nineteen oh six was the height during that time of the Jim Crow era. 14 years prior to women receiving suffrage in the United States. This was interesting back then that I saw, that I read. No instrument of music are used. None are needed. No choir, the angels have been heard by some in the spirit. No collection are taken. No bills have been posted to advertise the meeting. No church organization is back of it. Who are in touch with God realize as soon as they enter the bill, the meeting, the Holy Ghost is the leader. Many people tumble down shacks on Azusa, Azusa, Azusa Street. So this was a major event during the 19, get my dates right, the 1906 to 1915 that God began to move, reveal a part of himself through his spirit. And then the church was born according to the, using the Holy Spirit as the vehicle, the vessel, the teacher that you must have. The word of God within you. As I said, the 95 Thesis was said, nail or written on a board or wall. And God said to us in Jeremiah, I'm sorry, where's my Bible? I will put my laws, I'll put my laws in your hearts and minds. And me go away aside, uh, you see. Oh, God is, this is a side note that I have. God, the Father, is speaking through specific individuals that he has chosen to speak through. God, our Father, is not silent in today's climate. That you cannot see this or that. Listen, and you will hear our Father speaking about what is going on. Our Father is speaking about what is going on, what is happening on the world scene, and what is going to happen. God never does anything until he make it known to his prophets. Let me set my notes. Uh, see if I got it written down. I will put my laws in their heart. Let me type this out. Excuse me, find it for me. Uh,
Jeremiah 31, 33. Jeremiah 31, 33. It will not be like the covenant I made with their father when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws, my teaching, in their minds and inscribe them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. The Father said he will put his laws in our hearts and our minds, similar to these two individuals. Reveal one, reveal a teaching. If you want to argue or discuss, come and meet him, or send a letter response, and that produced the 95 thesis. The next event, major event in Christendom, was 1906, the Azusa Street Revival. And when I was going, you see, I put it down. I got, when I was writing it down, I said, when I saw, where's that? Where's my notes? This happened. Zuzu Street Revival took place in the United States of America. When I was writing out with my hand, Azuzu, A Z U S A. That was a revival, the first revival in the United States of America. I thought that was interesting. A Z U S A. Separate the two and say United States of America because that was the first spiritual revival. And there are others out there. They're trying to replicate, pray it back in, want it to appear, doing whatever to produce this. Telling people that God uh, was going to bring it back because they want to experience that type of revival again. But God is not doing the same thing over in that form. Excuse me. And then, you see, my note, I don't want to confuse the two that I have. And then I thought about Jesus' body was nailed to the cross. And the living, he said, I'm the living word, I'm the word of God. And I thought about the correlation between the bishop nailing then the 95 thesis to the wall, to the door of the church. And I thought about Jesus being nailed, the man Jesus being nailed to the cross. I say it symbolized God wants to put his law in our hearts and minds. When man, when he choose us or whoever he choose, he will tell us, what to say and we can be sure that we will be attacked everyone in the bible was attacked for preaching thus saith the lord the disciples were told do not preach in that name anymore i said in many messages the name jesus christ the name the bible definition to look up mean character do not preach in that you could say name. You could say they were preaching in the character and morality of God. God wants us to know he's silent no more. The prayers that the scripture said, Israel was praying to God and he said, I've heard their prayers. Is he hearing the prayers of his saints? Or have they given up? and think that God is silent. If you think about it, 
a lot of individuals feel and believe that God is silent. Because look what's happening, what's going on. God is silent. But God the Father is not silent. He's speaking. We just need to recognize the language that he's speaking and how he is speaking to us. And when we understand how he speaks to us, we can be assured that our Father, which are in heaven, want us to know. He don't want to hold anything back from us, but we must be in the right mindset to recognize that he's not silent anymore. We can be silent in our own prayer closet. I'm sorry, we can be silent when we don't want to speak out. We say, let someone else do it. And God is saying, I want you to do it. I want you to say this. No, I'm not going to do this. An abused person can say, I'm going to remain silent because nobody else believes me. And the scripture, uh, not scripture, but when I was a law enforcement, and say you have the right to remain silent, give us the right to remain silent. Anything you do or say will be used against you. You understand those rights that I explained them to you? You have a right to have an attorney while you being questioned. If you can't afford one, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, one will be appointed for you. Do you understand me right? Do you want an attorney? So you do have the right to remain silent when it comes to your rest. But when it comes to our Christian walk with God, that I put a book together and I did my version of Christian rights, you do not have the right to remain silent when it comes to our Christian walk and our behavior. We do not. Let me see if I have it. Uh, let's see, I think I do. Let's see if I have it. I'll start here. I got it somewhere in this note. I didn't intend to. This was not a part of the message, but being led by God, I see if I can find it. Okay, I thought it was in the stack of stuff that I have. I just have to make a mental note to share it. That we do not have the right to remain silent when it comes to our Christian walk. We have the right to speak the truth. We have the right to listen. We have the right to decide if what we're hearing is from God. The Lord is not silent anymore and when he speaks we should be able to recognize that he's not silent let me go to matthew 20 what is the meaning of an indulgence matthew 23 25 By the time I do part three, two, I'm sorry, I hope to be able to, because I feel stopped up in my nose. 23, 25, Matthew 23, 25. 
Woe unto you, scribes and you Pharisees. Pretend, I'm reading for that for my Bible. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, pretender, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the plate, but within they are full of extortion, prey, spoil, plunder, and gasping self-indulgence. We have our own self-indulgence. Some of us have more than others. We have given up our, what you want to say, pleasures that we know that God forbid, refuse to let something go, that God said let go. And we are holding on to that indulgence. And that's stopping him from moving on us. First Timothy 5, 6. Wherefore, she who lives in pleasure and self-gratification, giving herself up to luxury and self-indulgence, is dead even while she still lives. 1 Timothy 6.10 For the love of money is the root of all evil. It is through this craving, and some have been led astray, and have wandered from the faith, and perceive themselves through with many acute mental pain. Romans 12.2 Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapt into its exterior superficial custom, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new idea and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourself what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Colossians 3, 5. This is scripture that talking about self-indulgence and indulgence. Again, I apologize to my sound stuffy. Colossians, did I do sound stuffy? This page sticking together. It's weird when you read a, you get a new Bible and, and you're not accustomed to the pages. Just stick together. Come on. Colossians, Colossians, Colossians. Colossians 3 5. I'm sorry. Colossians 3 5. It reads, come on. So kill, deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses, and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin, sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desire, and all the greed and covenant, for that is idolatry, the defying of self and other created things instead of God. So I think it's Colossians 3 2 and set your mind and keep them on high what is above the higher things not on the things that are on the flesh Titus 3 3 again 3 3 for we also were once thoughtless and sinless, 
abstinent and disobedient, deluded and misled, we too were once slaves to all sorts of craving and pleasure, wasting our days in malice and jealousy and evil, envy, hateful, hated, detestful, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior, man has appeared. Page five, five, Here on earth, you have abandoned yourself to soft, prodigal, 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 P-R-O-D-I-G-A-L, living to the pleasure of self-indulgence and self-gratification. You have fattened your heart in the day of slaughter. You have been condemned and have murdered a righteous, innocent man while he offered no resistance. So be patient, brethren, as you wait to the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits expectantly for a precious harvest of the land. See how he keep patient, keep up his patient vigil over it until he receive the early, late. In First Peter 2, 9. Let me get through this. That is First Peter two nine. For if all these things are true, then be sure the Lord knows how to rescue the godly out of temptation and trials, and keep the ungodly under chastisement until the day of judgment and doom. And particularly those who walk after the flesh and indulge in the lust of polluting passion and scorn and despise authority, presumptuous and daring self-will and self-loving creatures, they scoff and revile dignitaries, glorious one without trembling. As I was reading all this, the thought came to me, it's almost like it can be like the bishop created the 95 thesis voices his concern about what was going on in the church at his time we are hearing the same thing not the same thing that he's saying we are experiencing the same thing in this ministry of thousands of messages and books and tapes and recorded messages and written messages on living the person ministry's website and the CPK YouTube channel, the, U the Living Epistle Ministry YouTube channel. Hundreds of messages could be, I won't say considered a 95 thesis, but it's a work of God speaking through our pastor, sharing what he wants us to hear. So let me see if I can say it. I'm trying to stay with the flow and hopefully when I do number three, part two i can tie it all together and show you where i'm coming from and where i'm going to go because i needed a particular note that i have before me i need to print it out but i'm going to sum it up sum it up like this god was silent 400 years between malachi and matthew then he began to speak and then the bible came on the scene i think the king james bible in the 16 11. i have a bible that are not with me, not right beside me, where someone translates the Bible in the from the original Greek. I'm sorry, the Bible is written in Aramaic, and they translate the original language because back then when the Bible was written in Aramaic, words had different meanings, and it was translated to a meaning today. For example, communication in the New Testament is not the same in the Old Testament. It has a different meaning and word changes over centuries and by knowing that we can see with that understanding we should not be uh be led off path if we have a good bible dictionary so the god is speaking now 
he has been speaking since he came out of being silent for 400 years. He called many people to bring forth his word, and they brought it in their understanding. And he went to the next person, and the next person, and the next person, to a woman, to a man, black, white, little nugget sprouting up from the average person on the street. Then the bishop did the 95 Thesis to voice his concern about what's going on in the body of Christ. Then God began, the Father began to manifest his power where music was not a part of the service. No advertisement. God, the Father, was advertising himself by revealing his miraculous power to the people. And even when God was doing that through the Zulu Street, the Zulu, a Zulu Street revival, the meter and certain religious individuals didn't like it, say it was mockery. So it was not well received. Some people didn't accept it. Some people didn't believe it. Some people didn't want to be a part of it because it was from a black, that's what I read in one of the articles, coming from a black ministry. The thinking is wrong. Then God came upon, we have the teaching, you see, I get it right. We have the God remained silent for 400 years. Then God, Jesus came in Matthew and began to speak what the Father told him to say. He did what the Father wanted him to do. He spoke the word of the Father. Anything, everything that he did, it was coming from the Father. Then you have the New Testament, 1611. Then you have the body of the different nomination. In the Christendom world. And you ever thought about it? This particular Bible. Everyone have a Bible. Everyone have different denominations. But something is wrong. What is wrong? They say those who preach and teach the word don't believe some of what's in the scriptures. Some religions believe this. Some religions believe that. Some say that was back in the day. Some say that was already took place. They all not together. They are all not together when it comes to believing the word of God. But I'm here today to tell you that they will come together when the man of Christ, the spirit of Christ Jesus, the spirit of the Father begin to manifest through the men, of, through the living epistle and ministry, and whoever God choose, they will get together and say what is being said and done is not of God. Look at them. Is that going to happen? Yes. It happened to Jesus and his disciples. It happened to the, the prophets in the Old Testament. So don't believe or think that it won't happen in our lifetime. That the body of Christ, when God began to manifest himself through individuals that will speak his word, what's going to happen? They're going to say, what's happening, what's going on, is not from the Father. And this me just popped in my mind. Let's see. Come on, where's my arm? Where are you? Where are you? Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 3. No, I'm sorry. Jeremiah 33 3. Thank you, Lord. I think it's Jeremiah 33.
It says Jeremiah 33. Let me see where I wanted to pick up at. Is that what I want to say? When Jeremiah was told to go to speak the word to the children of Israel. And fear not what they say. Fear not anything. Just speak what the Father wanted to be spoken. I'm trying to find the right verse. Again, I, like I said, we'll be a part two and I should tie everything together to show you a deep insight of the message. And I'm trying not to cross both of them together. I find it. Let me see if I have it in this my notes. So it's my prayer that what you heard for starters let you know God is still on the throne if you're going to use that knowledge uh, if you're going to use that image nothing is not happening without God in the midst of it. And let's see. Try not to. I don't have it. Don't have it. Anyway, let me tie it together and close. Lord, I pray that what I brought forth will be edifying to those who listen. And when we come together in part two, it will be more clear than what you have revealed to me to show the brethren and those who listen. And I say this, to tie it together, to show you where I'm coming from. What the Lord showed me in preparing this message. I thought I was going to be preaching solely on indulgence, indulgences and struggle with the title. And in my research and putting together, the verse came to my mind. Psalm 53. And I came for my title. God will not be silent anymore. God will not be silent. I don't have it anymore to that, but I'm going to add it. God will not be silent anymore. He has spoken and is speaking and has spoken from Genesis to Malachi and 400 years of silence took place. Jesus came on the scene, the man Jesus. The word of God was written down in 1611, translated in many variations up to the day. Then the 95 Thesis of Peter where the bishop had a problem of what was going on in the church of his time. Then God showed his power in signs and wonders without music through the Zuzu Street Revival, the first event of his kind that I know of that a lot of people is unaware of. And what happened in 1970, God chose Pastor Sheila Vitali to bring forth the doctrine of Christ. The Zuzu Street Revival and then a 95 Thesis and God remained, God was silent 400 years, culminate to the living epistle ministry, which you will hear how God showed it to me. I didn't make it up. I really didn't. You can believe it or you don't have to believe it. But it's the spirit that you choose to believe. God showed me how these events came about after the Zuzu Street revival died down. The body of Christ went to do what? The basic things that we see today. I'm hearing stuff 
when I was 18, is still being preached today. Jesus is coming back soon. Jesus is coming back soon. The question that we should ask ourselves, how will we be able to identify Jesus? By a picture that's on the wall in your room, in your house? Or what you think Jesus should look like? What if he's black? What if he's white? What if he's a female? How are we going to determine that is the Jesus? When scripture clearly say, warn to those who come and say, I'll come. Don't follow after them. There are a lot of teaching that have been preached today with catchy titles to appease the person's desire to cause people to go into self-indulgence. Yes, I can do these things even though I know there's consequences because I heard it from this preacher. Because I'm not hearing anything different. I'm hearing everyone is saying the same thing in a certain form. And then, after the Jesus Freak revival, they're crying out for a new revival. And God brought forth living epistle ministry, the doctrine of Christ, the spiritual teaching, showing us the word, breaking the spiritual nugget, showing us the meanings of words, the meaning of scriptures, how God communicates, that is phenomenal. Another revelation of God manifested on the world scene, speaking since I look at Pastor Bio where it says she was studying in 1970, and then the doctrine of Christ came on in 1980, if I'm correct. Sam to be corrected if I said it wrong, but I'll look at it again. Series of events, different time which is interesting that I'm going to show the different time zone, the different times, how it came to be. And you going to, might walk away and say, wow, because it's true. It's true. There was a period where God remained silent. From Malachi to New Testament, Jesus came on the scene. It is true that the 95 thesis was written by the bishop voicing his concern about what's going on in the church of his era. Then the revival of the Jesus Creed, showing the power of God, and then living the epistle ministry with birth came forth, and showing us the spiritual side of God, how he's communicating, what he wants to do. Just like the bishop was voicing his concern about what's going on in the body of Christ in his era, Living Epistle teaching in her pastor books and many messages and the ones I have mentioned in the book has mentioned and other people who've spoken in Living Epistle ministry have shared over the years. Revealing the other side of the Father, the spiritual side of the Father, the spiritual side of the Father. God wants you and I to know he's speaking. Many years ago, God gave me a title, which was in a book. He still speaks now. Listen. He's always speaking. We're just not listening. We want to listen to what we want to hear. So we gloss over, pretend we don't hear, because he's not saying what we want to hear. God, the Father, is speaking. Are you willing to say, thank you, Lord. When I think of Samuel, thought Eli was calling him, he jumped up three times to know. I appear, I felt that God is calling you. So when he called you again, this is what you need to say, which I'll get into the next message, which all of it will be brought together. And you'll be amazed and surprised how Lord tied all this together with dates and months that I did my research. Yes, I can say I'm not going to preach that part of the message. Yes, I can say that's foolish and uh, my kind of mind get in the way. It may me. I, I prayed about it. I looked as long as someone do the math. Do the math. If you come up with one plus one is two, then you did the math. But then as I put this message together, 
I perceive that I have done the math. And I close, because Lord, I want me to say it again. There was a point before, oh, there was a point where he remained silent for 400 years. And he came and stopped speaking in the New Testament to the man Jesus and his disciples. Then the written word was written down in six translated from the original text, 1611, and given to the public. And we began to learn about the Father. Then the 95 Thesis came about, and that individual had a problem with what was going on in the church of his day. 500 years passed, the power of God came down in Azusa Street in the United States of America, and people was healed. No music, just the power of God coming down. And I was saying that a few minutes ago, I said, Lord, are you telling us that, that not the Azusa Street is going to come down again, but by preaching and teaching your word, we will begin to see signs of wonder pouring out from whomever you call to bring forth your word and as you declare to us there will be there will be attacked physically maybe physically or verbally at most that what is being done is not of god why because it didn't come to them because they have a mega ministry or whatever whatever and dividing the people but then many thousands and thousands of people of multiple races going to come to hear what doth saith the Lord. And he tells his prophet, Fear not what man may say about you or want to do to you. Speak my word. Whether they want to accept it or don't want to hear it, just speak my word. And that's what he's called us to do. Speak his word in the book. Speak my word. Speak my word. I refuse. I'm not going to be silent anymore. God can just, the Father can take a speech, snap a spiritual finger, finger, and we will cease to exist. The world as we know it will cease to exist and start all over. You will not be you anymore and whatever, whomever you think of, will never exist anymore. But the Father in heaven, God our Father, want us to understand that he is speaking. The problem is, some of us don't want to listen. To do what we want to do and say what we want to say and fall short and things happen to us, we run and blame God. I'm not telling you nothing that I haven't done myself over the years prior to knowing living in the ministry. As I said, I did the math. That's where I'm coming from. Those spiritual things did happen. As one say, Google it. It did happen. At different time frames. We have living epistle ministry on the world, not on the world scene as we would like it to be or God don't want it to be yet or he has not prepared the minds of the people or whatever. And the thought came to me, going around about, but figure out what I'm saying. Some people have to experience something before they believe. Some people have to experience something before they accept something, before they listen. You can show people the truth, they'll listen. But when they experience the opposite of the truth, then they will believe the truth. God is speaking today on the world scene, in your life, in my life. Are you ready to listen? So it's my prayer, Father, I close with this. When I bring forth part two, may you tie it all together. I laid the foundation, I laid the appetizer, I laid the exhortation, if you, I want to call it that. To me, it sounds confusing. Like a lot of times, stuff sounds confusing to me. And 
I go back and listen to it and it fall right into place. I learned that, yes, I can have my notes and want to stick to them, which is okay. But then sometimes God intervene and say, go left, go right, say this, and don't say that. But I'm sure that he's in the midst of this message. That he wants you to realize the time is at hand. He is not silent. We're going to experience. We're going to see his power moving through whoever he choose. And if God be for us, no man can be against us. If God is for the spirit of Christ, if the Father, the Father is for the spirit of Christ, Jesus manifesting through us, no carnal man manifesting the evil spirit will come against the true person of God. No man. Everything happened for a reason. Trust in God. If you have not been listening and think he was not speaking, uh, recognize he has spoke and you didn't listen and you did your own thing, just simply confess it. What harm would it to do if you don't? He is speaking. He's speaking. And now I put this together, it's popped in my mind. A lot of individuals is not aware that there was a 400 period where God was silent. And whatever my thing, uh, my research says, there's no prophet, no word came forth, just silent. Silent. And then he appeared in the New Testament. And from there on, He's still talking. We just need to be able to recognize his voice. Living the Epistle Ministry website, God is talking, has spoken, and continues to speak. Living the Epistle Ministry books, God has spoken in those books, and he's speaking. And he will speak when you read those books. It's not about trying to remember everything and understand. No. According to your spiritual maturity, you understand as he sees fit. Let him teach you what he wants you to know. The YouTube channel, the CC channel, and the messages, God is speaking. You want to say the word of God has been, came from God into through the vessel that he chose, and he wants to nail those scriptures put those scriptures put those verse put those teachings into our mind into our heart physical heart spiritual heart the mind we must have the mind of god dwelling within us we must have the father's spirit manifesting through us and everything we say and do it will be the father that we will say it's the Father who is telling me to say this. God will not give his glory to another. He wants to be recognized. The Father sent the man, sent his spirit working through the man, Jesus of Nazareth. And everything Jesus did, he says the Father. The works that I do is the Father. It's the Father. Begin to accept him as he's revealed himself to all of us. He's silent no more. He's speaking. Are you listening for that still voice? Wherever he may be in your walk, he's speaking. He's speaking. And he wants you to know that living epistle ministry for such a time as this was birthed on the scene through Pastor Sheila Vitale on her studies. When he first called her, look her website, you see her history, her journey when God called her, her story. Come on the website, livingepistleministry.org. And when Living Epistle Ministry came on full force, her study in 1970 and in 1988 and up to this day, a spiritual journey 
the father was speaking to is has spoken to her is speaking now think about it god is the same today and yesterday he's still the same in the beginning in the beginning god spoke god then think about this one before genesis chapter one the father was quiet and god said let us make man i'm sorry god said speak to heaven and earth and that is when god began to speak that's how you read my notes thank you Lord. before the foundation of the world before creation was formed it was God, the Father, other spiritual entities, maybe other worlds, I don't know. And then he spoke this world into existence. Period of silence. He wants a vessel where he can speak through and speak to himself. How, Anthony, how do you mean God wants to speak through himself? When the Father put his spirit in you and I, it is part of himself in you and I. Jesus said, the words that I speak, the things that I do, is the Father in me. Say, if you love me, you take my commandment, obey my commandment. The Father and I will come and put ourselves, we will make our home, we will suck with you, we will be within you. So the Father is speaking to part of himself in us. And when we speak what he wants to speak, said, we will see and we should believe that the power of God will flow through us. Just like, the, not like the Zuzu speak the Bible, but the presence of the Father will be in us. We will know the thoughts of individuals that we come across intend to harm us or do whatever the father will say turn left turn right don't go there stay here and whatever because he has as one will say our back when we become a vessel that the father wants to use he just be he be using himself to be a blessing to others because he want people to know don't give up those of you in the sign of my voice who think that God is quiet, God is silent, he's not doing anything about your life or what you're going through or what you have gone through or what you need to be happening or what's happening in any parts of the world, your dreams, your goals, God don't even, is not concerned about anything. For those of you who are in fear who have given up and say God is dead as some movie has came out they've been playing he's saying to you and I today I'm I'm not silent I'm speak find your peace your comfort your joy your strength your wisdom in him and listen for the still voice and make sure it's the father speaking to you thank you lord i pray that those who listen will be blessed with what you want them to have i stand in agreement with their prayers that your will will be done in their life your will will be done in their life thank you I pray that when I come to do part two, that you would tie it together. You in the midst of this message, Lord, you, I'm doing it as you have given it to me. Thank you. Lord, will I be back in part two? And we pray that all is well in your life. Thank you.